God is on the throne and prayer changes things. Lord, we pray to you, O oh God, that you will again continue to help us understand the future by our present and by our past. Anoint your servant, O oh God, to pick up where he left off, O oh God, that the people that have been following, O oh God, will have understanding in the various groups uh, that you're coming to gather to yourself, O oh God. I ask and I pray that this will happen, O oh God, by your spirit and by your word. In Jesus' name and for his name's sake, amen. Praise God. I want to pick up where I left off. And I'm, I'm left off in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 18. And the sons of Noah that went forth out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Javith. And Ham became the father of Canaan. And so right here, we were talking about various groups and various kinds. So out of Adam and Eve was the world that was destroyed before the flood. God chose of all of the groups and kinds that he created in that world only to preserve the ones that he put on the ark. And so coming off the ark is more than one mankind. And then you don't know that it's more than one mankind until this chapter be begin to flow. So these are the things that were on the ark. And we, we, we heard in the last message, God put seven kinds of the clean, of every clean kind. And every unclean animal, he bought two pairs of that kind. So hence you had four of that kind, and you had 14 of the clean kind. And he loaded the ark with those various seeds, with their various flesh, and he put them in their order on the ark. And God decided to put four kinds of family there. So you had the original Noah and his wife, they made up one kind. But then they had sons, Shem, Japheth, and Ham, and it doesn't tell you who their wives were. But they got on the ark, and each one got on there with their kind. And so you had four couples. It's very important to understand that from those four couples, God is going to populate the new earth. So in Genesis 9, verse 18, he introduced another kind, but you didn't, didn't realize that. He says, and the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Javith. So he says, Noah had three sons, and they had wives to produce the different orders from their kind. Are you with me? But then he introduced another kind. And he says, and Ham was the father of Canaan, because Ham would sleep with Noah's wife and produce another group and another kind. And so you have five kinds and five groups. All right. So it tells you why. And that's why, it, 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 you know, I'm not going into that story. I've been in that story before how who, who Ham and Canaan is and how he slept with his father's wife. Verse 19. These are the three sons of Noah and 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 of them with the whole earth overspread. So he's going to tell you that the various groups that I'm about to name now, they were going to be overspread on the earth. But remember now, they are going to have daughters, and the daughters becomes the place for the seeds of the gods. So in Genesis 6, I'm going to have to go back there real quick because something was read there, but you missed it. Genesis 6, and it says, verse 4. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that. And so also after that. So now what I'm going to talk about is the groups that will come after the flood. And they will come on these kind. So what happens? And so Genesis 10 here, verse 1. Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and unto them were sons born after the flood. Okay, whenever you see the word gener generation of, it means what I told you prior. So you don't know what's going to happen until you see the next generation that tells you what you're about to read. 
In other words, some people, some countries and language and cultures, they write from the right to the left and others from the left to the right. Some write from the top to the bottom and others write from the bottom to the top. And unbeknown to you, when the writers are writing here, they're going backwards. So when it says, this is the generations of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, it pointed everything I was talking about. But then it's going to tell you now, somebody's going to, because Noah dies. So somebody's going to tell you about the families that's going to come from the four groups that I read about. Okay. So it says, and so from verse two, all the way down to the end, it's going to tell you about the 70 families. And this is known as the table of nations or the groups. So these are all their own group and they're going to go and live on the earth with their kind. You got me? So it will say things like this. Verse five. Genesis 10 verse five. But these by these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands. Everyone after his tongue, after their families and their nation. So he's talking about verse two to verse five is telling you these are the sons of Javeth. And they went with their family, with their kind. So if you were listening to me in the last couple of weeks and I used the air, air, airport example, everybody went to their own terminal to get on their own family plane. Okay. So it's telling you and it's giving you an example of what the resurrection is going to look like by how the past used to be. So then verse six starts telling you about Ham. And the sons of Ham, Cush and Mizraim. And so all so so from verse so verse from verse six, the verse 19 is going to tell you about Ham and Canaan. Remember now in chapter nine. It told you that Ham was the father of who? Canaan. So hence, when you get to verse 15, let's read that. And Canaan begot Sidon, his and firstborn. And so notice, so it's going to give you the four groups. So in Genesis 10, even though people think there's three groups, Japheth, Ham, and, 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 and Seth, they don't realize that was talking prior. Because starting with verse 2, it's, it, it, it's going to tell you of four groups. So there's four groups here in that three. So you have Javeth, verses 2 to verse 5. Then you have Ham, verse 6 to verse 14. Then from verse 15 to verse 19 is Canaan. And, that, and Canaan is where you get, are y'all ready for this? The Jebusites, the Amorites. In other words, from Canaan, you get the giants, not from Ham, but you get it from Ham because Ham slept with his mother. And what did that produce? Ah, see, 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 there was a different kind. And that's why this kind is separate from the, why, why didn't Javeth have this kind? Why didn't Shem have this kind? Because who Noah's wife was. Ah, see, you never knew who his wife was. You only knew who Noah was. And who was Noah? He was a son of God. And so, oh, I don't want to get there. I'm going I'm to stick, stick it to the groups. Stick it to the groups. So, so what you got? You got four groups. And so verse and verse verse 20. These are the sons of Ham after their families, after their tongues. Notice what it says here. After their tongues, but their tongues haven't come yet. Listen to me, y'all. The tongues haven't come yet. So the writer here is telling you, he's telling you something about a group that hasn't happened yet. In other words, you haven't got to the Tower of Babel yet, but he's telling you, yes, you have. So why? Because now they're going to tell you how they got their tongues. But before they tell you about that, they go from verse 21 to verse 30. And verse 21 is the, the group called Shem. Verse 21. Unto Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Jacob. Now Eber is Hebrew. 
So, so, so the first one mentioned up from Shem is Hebrews. That's the Hebrews that's going into slavery. Eber is Heber. Eber. That's where the word Hebrew comes out of. Out of Eber comes the Hebrews. Why? Because he's, that's not the only group to come out of Eber. He has many sons and daughters. But one of the groups that come out of Eber is known as the Hebrews or the children. What does Hebrew mean? Children of Eber. So, um, so when you when you say Hebrews, that word is made of different words to tell you children of Eber. How do you say children of Eber? Hebrew. <laughs> okay. How do you say children of, of Aaron? Holly, my last name. Those are Hollies. Are uh, you get me? Okay. All right. And so Shem children is going to be from verse twenty one all the way to verse thirty. In verse 31 then, let's read. These are the sons of Shem, after their families, after their tongues. After their tongues. But the tongues haven't gotten yet. Into, at, least, at least you haven't read the story how they got their tongue. Go ahead. After their tongues and their lands, after their nations. And notice that all of them have nations. So back then, this is known as the table of nations. So if you was to count from verse 2 to this last verse, it's 70 nations with 70 different languages. And it's important because there's going to be another day where someone comes down and give languages. It's known as Pentecost. In other words, this group here must have a Pentecost. But you didn't know they had a Pentecost. And so let's see if the sons of God come down. So, so far, we've seen two times with the sons coming down. One that is, is there, but is, is but it's not talking about, not least in the beginning. The other one is talked about, but I have to grab verses from other prophets' books to tell you the story. Then let me go into this story so you can understand the resurrection. All of these stories, I'm telling you, is so you can understand there's different groups coming up with their kind at the resurrection and everyone in their order. So verse one of chapter 11. And the whole earth was of one language and one speech. So back then before they, and so when they got off the ark, they all still had the same language of one kind, although they were all different. They all had only one language. Are you with me? So it said they had one language as well as one speech. There's a difference between the language and the speech. I already gave that teaching. I'm not going over again. It's going to be a sidebar. And so they came and they dwelled in the east and found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelled there. And so something happened. Verse 5. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men build it. So I want you to listen to me. See, I told y'all what happened in Genesis 1. Notice it's something similar going on here. So somebody come down, and it, he has the name Lord or the title Lord. Look, look what verse 4 says. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven. So they wanted to go up there where he, the Lord came from. Where did they want to do? They wanted to go to heaven. So they built space shuttles. And they say, we will find them. There's life up there. We will find them, they said. So they built their tower so that it could reach heaven. See, I'm speaking in a parable because people have eyes, but they can't see. They have ears, but they can't hear. Ain't nothing new under the sun. See, there's people that are saying, we will find life. No, you don't have to find life because the Lord God come down. He's going to come to you. So the Lord God came down and dwelt among us, and we beheld him. And he said, there's only one way you can get to heaven if you're in the right suit. Me. Oh, I don't want to go there yet. So verse 5 and 6. Go ahead, Katura, read it again. 
And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold. So now he's going to talk to people. He ain't talking to the people down here. So watch who he talk to. The people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down. So that means he had went back because he said, let's go back down. So he came down, he saw. So the Lord came down to the earth. He saw what they were doing. Then he went back among his peers, his equals, the us. This is not God coming down because God can't fit in the earth. <laughs> this is the one of his sons coming down. So one of the sons of God came down and he goes up to the other ones and he says, look, them people had lost their mind. Let, let, read that verse again. Behold, the people is one and they have all one language and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down. No, so he, Notice what he says. I can't go down alone. Why? Because all of these are not my seed. All of our seeds have got together as one. This has never been the plan. They're mixing. They're mixing seeds. Which only can produce monsters. Jesus. Hence, whenever a seed touch another seed, you get syphilis, gonorrhea, AIDS. Whenever sex is crossed be between species, judgment comes into that new species. God has designed judgment when species have sex with the wrong species. So he said, look what they've done. They're mixing seeds. Even though we put them different on the ark in their order. They, 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 you in your wrong group. Get in your lane and stay in your lane. Come, get in your calling and stay in your calling. Unless you called out because you don't belong there. So he said, let us go down. So unbeknown to people, many lords came down because he's one of many lords. So, so verse 8. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. And so the name of the city was called? Therefore is the name of it called Babel. Because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. So what was the city called? Babel. But they, people are talking about the land of Babylon. God didn't talk about a land. He only talked about a city. And is the city Babel, was it here? Or was it like the New Jerusalem up there? See how spiritual I can get? Mm -hmm. Now, I want to backtrack. Why? Because when God came down in Genesis 5, I want to go all the way back to Genesis, f no, Genesis 10. I want to go back to the table of nations. In Genesis 10, I want to go back to uh, one of the children of Shem. And remember now, Shem had Eber, right? And so I want to go, verse 25. Let's what, and so why? I want to put the story, the past together, because you didn't know all of the things that happened. Genesis 10, verse 25. And unto Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg. For in his days was the earth divided. And so something happened with the children of Eber. What happened? In his days, God divided the groups back into their order. 
Because prior to that, they were one speech and one language. So, so what did God do? He put everybody back in their place. In other words, be with the people that speak your language. You ever married somebody? Oh, oh no, don't answer that question. I can I really say, have you married somebody and they don't speak your language? Do you, <laughs> do you know anybody other than yourself who married somebody and they didn't speak the same speech, although they had the same language? They all spoke in English, but they could never get along. Why? Their speech was different. You must have the right speech and the right language to be one with the person you live with. Otherwise, you speak in English and that person don't know a word you're talking about because they don't understand your speech. And in other words, what did you mean by what you say? Because they can't feel your presence. But that's deep. Moving back to the story. Eber had two sons. One name was Peleg because that word means earthquake. So this is what it says. In the days of Eber, God gave him two boys so that Eber could give us history. And Eber named the histories. He says, when the earthquake came, God used water to separate the earth from the earth, and we now have continents where we used to be one. So that's what Peleg means. That's where you got the continents. Not millions of years. In the day that the God came down and did it in the day. So he didn't come down and do a flood and do the earth all over again. This time he tried to say, he said, I would separate the groups by water and continents and by rivers and by lakes. So hence, God will separate the 70 in this chapter. That's why he's trying to tell you what happened during the days of the 70. When they were all gathered together, God came down with a mighty wind and mighty power and separated them. You ever have heard a day of mighty wind in the upper room when he gave languages and then he scattered them? In other words, he brought persecution in the book of Acts and scattered them with their language all over the continents in the world. How many of you know that he's still spreading and he ain't stopped spreading yet? The same way it was done in the past is being done today to make his body. Because he has to call people out of their kind and their group into his kind and group. Hence, he calls you, and that's the day you got saved. You got called. But out of the call, only a few would be chosen. And out of the chosen, only a few would be faithful. And get on the ark. And go to the other side, to a new world. To do what? To start a new species. But I, I, I digress. And he had a brother named Joktan. Joktan means cut him in half. So if you know anything and if you study this, when you get to Genesis 11, something interesting happened. Verse 10. Right after God says, let's go down and scatter them, the story goes into the generation. Remember? And it says, go ahead. These are the generations of Shem. So it's telling you what happened in Shem's generation. Go ahead. Shem was 100 years old. But remember now, it always point backwards. Somebody else now is going to tell you about going forward. So Shem is telling you the story about them coming down. You hear me? Shem is telling you the story of the tower. Then someone else is going to tell you the story of Chim's generation. And that would be verse 31. I'm sorry, verse 27. So who's going to tell us about all of the stuff prior? Verse 27. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah is going to tell you about all of the things that happened between the tower and his day. And he writes it on stone. So all of these stories are being written on stones, and the person that's telling the story, it says, this is the generation. This is my history, says Terah. And Terah picks up, and he says, and Shem had a child when he was two, two years after the flood. He's going to tell the story of his great-great-grandfather. 
or great 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 grandfather because Shem is still alive when he's telling the story. In other words, my daughter Deborah interviewed my mother to tell her story. So my mother's obituary is already written, even though I got a sister who wanted to write the story from her point of view. But she's not writing it from my mother's point of view because my daughter interviewed my mother to get her story. But my daughter got her story about her mother and she's going to put that obituary based off what she wants in the obituary based off of that story. Then I'm going to get up and do the eulogy and tell my story in the eulogy. How many with me? All three stories are going to be different. One from Gloria, one from Dubber the baby, and one from the son, the oldest son. I want to tell the story of my mother from the being her prophet and her pastor. Only I can tell that story. Are you with me? So Terah tells the story from verse 11 all the way to verse 26. Are you getting me? Then he dies, and somebody in there have to tell the story about Terah. You can't tell your own story when you did. Okay? And so in the story, he's telling you about Eber was 30 years, verse 16. He tells you how old was Eber when Peleg was born. So hence, because I know time, and time is, is my gift and grace, I can tell you the story of when the continents came. I can tell you when, 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 when the exodus happened. I can tell you to the exact year, and in most cases, the exact month and day. In other words, I can tell you the day Jesus was really born. But, uh, but, but, but we practiced December the 25th. But if you really wanted to know the real day, I could tell you the day he was born according to the scriptures, not according to tradition. And I don't fight tradition. I never win, even in my own church. <laughs> Moving right along. So, where was I? And, and even lived after he begat Peleg 430 years and begat sons and daughters. But it don't tell you about Joktan. But it does tell you about Joktan in numbers because it gives the years of when the men and how long they live. And if you know anything, I told you Joktan means to cut in half. So when the earthquake came, God changed how everything grew in the, in the, in the climate and everything changed. So man's life expectancy was cut in half. And so in Genesis chapter 11, we get the lifespans of when God judged different times and cut their lifespan in half. And so man was living to be up to 960 some years. God cut it in half. See, you look at Shem and, and, and he begat sons and daughters. Verse, verse 11, and Shem lived after he begat Aphex 500 years and begat sons and daughters. You add his 500 to his uh, 100 and he lived to be 600 years. But when you get to Aphaxev, he lived, he lived after he begat Salah 403 years. And you put that with his, his, his um, 35, you can see that the 400 and Ephraim, after the gods, the sons of God got off the ark, their children didn't have their attributes in that new world. They could not live like they did because they didn't come from the world that was on the other side of the flood. I want you to hear this. No, the groups that are going to be created from these sons on the ark don't have the same resistance and power in their body like their parents. So that Shem is going to outlive eight generations of his own children because of his body and his power of how he lived on the other side. Even though he's living in the same world they are, there's something different about Shem. And there's something different about Noah because Noah will live 350 years after the flood, making his lifespan 950 years. Shem will live all the way. Remember, when Abraham, Shem dies when Abraham is 150 years old. So Shem goes all the way down into the life of Abraham. And remember, Abraham had Isaac when he's 100. So 
when Isaac is 50 years old, Shem dies. So guess who's alive during Abraham and Isaac's journey with God? A man who walked with God on the other side. And so it's giving you their history, but it's giving time with it to show you that these groups are being created in their order after their kind based off of their calling. Are you with me? I know you lost. Okay, John 10. And so if you read from verse chapter, chapter 11 from verse 10 all the way to verse 26, it's giving you history of a lifespan. And it's telling you it's different from the world previously. And it's, and it's breaking them up in their groups after their kinds in that group. Okay. Uh, now, verse 27. You read about Terah, but you found out that Terah had three sons. So somebody have to tell you the story of Terah. Terah is telling the story of his people. Then somebody, when Terah died, tells Terah's story. So there has to be one of the three sons have to tell the story that I had two brothers and myself. And then they tell you that Terah had three sons and all of them, I want you to hear this, in the scriptures are known as mighty men. And how can you have a mighty man? You have to be born from a Nephilim. And so Abraham is what we would call a prince among them. Why? Because Abraham is born from a Nephilim. And who are the Nephilim? They are born by gods. Sleeping with daughters. Are you with me? So it says, so, so it was after the flood. People, the gods were steadily coming down. Now we saw already in Genesis 11 when the God says, let us come down. Let's see if Moses tell us about that story. Deuteronomy, type chapter 32, verses 8 and 9. Why? Because Moses know he read the book of Genesis. He didn't write the book of Genesis. I just showed you. Terah wrote some of it. Is oh, I haven't gotten to Ishmael in them. <laughs> I'm trying to tell you, Adam wrote part of it. Noah wrote part of it. Shem, Japheth, and Ham wrote sections. So do that, which you know so far. Adam wrote his part. Noah wrote his part. Shem, Japheth, and Ham, that's up to five, wrote their part. I ain't got to the end of Genesis. Why? Because there's 16 authors in the book of Genesis according to the writings of Genesis because people told us what they wrote and who they were. 16 authors. And the person that wrote the most books in Genesis is Ishmael. He wrote 13 chapters. It's 50 chapters altogether. And the person that wrote the most was Ishmael. You will find that amazing. Because the Bible says, this be the generation of Ishmael. And boy, when you see what he wrote, it's 13 chapters. Why? He had to write about Isaac because he was there when Isaac was born. <laughs> he had to write about what happened with his mom and him in the desert because he was there in the desert. You see, there's stories that only him and Hagar knew because Abraham wasn't with him. <laughs> Oh, yeah, you, can, you can't make this stuff up. Okay, where was I? Because I'm getting excited again. Ooh, Jesus. Okay. I was in Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9. Let's read it, Keturah. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance. And so there came a day when the Most High, then we're going back to God, the Trinity again. So what did the Most High do one day? This is what the Most High did one day. He told one of the sons of God to go down and see what they were doing. That son of God came down and saw what they're doing, went down and saw the other gods. And so the most God said to the sons, he said to a group of them. And he, told, he counted how many there was based off of how many was down there. So when the most I did it, what did he do with the most I do when he did that? He separated them by what? The numbers of the sons of God. At that day, how many sons of God did he have? It tells you he has 70. But each son of God had his own what? Language and his own kingdom up there. 
So the type and shadow up there was the same as the type of shadow down here. Now, I'm going to prove all of this to you. I'm not going to just give you stuff and don't leave you hanging like that. Read this verse, 89. When he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. No, that word children of Israel there is only mentioned in the Masoretic text. If you know anything about our translation, there are three, three main sources of translations. The Septuagint, the Masoretic text, and the Dead Sea Scrolls. Well, the Masoretic text is the only place where they use the sons of Israel. And the Septuagint is known as the angels of God or the sons of God. Because there's more than one masterpiece of the Septuagint. So why do some of them say in the Septuagint, angels of God and sons of God? Ain't it amazing that a lot of people said the angels came down and slept with men and women? We use for the sons of God. Ah, keep, hold that thought. But when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, all of the, the writings there all reference the Son of God. And of course, if you know anything about the Quran that tells stories too, it's also known as the Sons of God. So the, 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 the predominant interpretation of this verse is Sons of God. Why? Because the Sons of Israel wasn't born yet to divide the nations. <laughs> So if God did it after something, after it had to be before something he did. Oh, y'all lost on that. I do it. I'm going to slow that down with it. If God said he did this after something, it existed already. Israel ain't born yet. Abraham ain't born yet. So it wasn't done after the sons of Israel. That means somebody did decide what? To make it after the sons of Israel, which is also a true interpretation. Y'all didn't know that. Why? Because there were 70 sons of Israel. The 70 came out of, the 70 went into the bondage in Egypt. And so they're saying that, that those were the same 70 that the nation was made of. So you can't lose if you say the sons of God, the angels of God, other sons of God. But what happens when you make it the sons of God? The story falls in place. Mm -hmm. So 70 sons of God came down. Each son of God each son of God had their own tongue. So on the day of Pentecost, 120 of them came down. And each tongue sat on somebody and went into them. And that's why to this day, you have never seen anybody baptized with a tongue. Because the seed was in them, and they were to go out in the world with 120 different tongues, baptizing people with that particular tongue. So who came in the upper room? <gasps> and so let's read that in slow motion. Acts, Acts chapter 2. Verse 1 and 2 and 3. But watch what happens. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven. Oh, they heard a sound from heaven. Go ahead. As of a rushing mighty wind, and it was filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them, Cloven tongues. So what appeared to them? What came out of the wind? A, a entity. In the shape of a... But it's an entity. Where did, where, what, 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 so the wind brought the entities. So what was in the wind? So in the Holy Ghost was these entities. I told you it's going to get too deep. <laughs> so the wind, not winds with an S, the wind come in the room. And out of the wind comes these entities in a shape of a tongue. What do the tongue do? Keep reading, Keturah. And it sat upon each of them. So each one of the entities sat on somebody, said, this is mine. <laughs> Well, I ain't done. And so each entity 
which is different from the other entity, sat on the one that they chose. Now, once the entity sat on them, it had to do something. It didn't want to stay on the outside. So the entity went into their body. How did they know when the entity got in? They spoke. It took over their what? Their tongue. To let them know that another tongue was in them. Then did everybody get the same tongue? No. Which means how many groups was created that day from the Holy Ghost? Over 120. That's the number they give. But 500 saw them go up. <laughs> Why? Let's keep reading. And they were all filled with the, the Holy Ghost. So what they were all filled with. So what was each tongue? A different language of the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. Y'all didn't hear that. Because the tongue came out of the Spirit of God. I can't go into each language and each tongue, what they mean and everything. That's a, that's a, that's a six month message. So let me go back to the, let me go back to the fact that 70 tongues came down. Now I'm going to go back to Genesis where I said to you, 70 tongues came down because he said, let us go down and confuse their what? So what came down that day? 70 spirits. And what did they have to do in order for people to speak the new language? They had to get inside them. And so guess what you have to do now every time you're born? Why are you learning the language from the outside? When back then, everybody still no language from the inside. Notice that when they came down, nobody learned the new language instantaneously speaking of language, not going to that lying school system that exists in the world that controls your speech, not your language. Thank you, Couture. Okay. Okay. I know this is deep. So, I, so watch the story. Genesis 126. Let us go down there. Somebody comes down. All of these and out of these bodies, they're gonna house other people to come down and get into the body. The body that people are already in. Because God is trying to tell you the future. That He's gonna make a body for His Son, and He's gonna come down and get in that body. In other words, the Holy Ghost still had to come down and get in Jesus, even though Jesus was already in himself. Did I lose you? In other words, Jesus don't get baptized with the Holy Ghost until he come out of the water after he got into the water. Mm -hmm. So Jesus had to be born of the water. Oh, hold on, let me start. Jesus had to be born again. Salvation. Mm -hmm. That would be Hebrews chapter 5. He cried out to him who was able to save him. So he needed a savior. So he cried out to God to be saved and not be a sinner. So in the days of his flesh, he cried out to him who was able to save him. And he was heard. He, he got saved. But then he had to be obedient. So he had to be water baptized. John said, man, you don't need this. He said, man, to be, fulfill all righteousness, yes, I do. So he, he knew that he wasn't right while he was in the flesh. And when the word become in flesh, that ain't good. <laughs> because there's no good thing in the flesh. So they called Jesus good. He said, there's none good but God. See? Let me, and so people still have a problem with that verse, that he was not good. They have a problem with he cried out and got saved. You see, they have a problem with the scripture. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they're not in that group. Oh. So they can't see what I just said. Even though they can read it, they can't see it. They can read it, but they can't hear it. Why? Because their doctrine stops it from hearing the word. So let me say it again. As it was in the past, Jesus had to fulfill it in the present of, that he was in, and then becomes our future. Hence, we are born of women. And born of man, then we get born again. Then we get we go water baptized. We get born of the water. Then we get born of the spirit. It gives us a new language. Now we have how many salvations? Look at the creature we have become. So how can you stand in my group 
if you ain't even got the Holy Ghost? Yeah. How can you stay in my group? You ain't been water baptized. Yeah. You, you get to the airport, you got to go to your group. <laughs> now, he's been making groups ever since. Notice that everything had to come out of the water. Even Noah and the ark. <laughs> everything is being repeated, repeated, repeated. Notice that the children of Israel, when they came out of Egypt, notice they had to go through the Red Sea. They had to go through it. They had to go over it. The Lord didn't let them go over. Why? Because they couldn't become a new creature if they didn't go through it. And so what did they go through? The Bible says they went into Moses. He had a new flesh. Why? He saw God on the mountain. Not only that, when he was born, his mother hid him. Why? He was born of a different flesh. He was different from the other kids. She saw him and she said, he's not like Aaron. He's not like Miriam. Let's see, let's see if the gods would win. So she put him in the water and called on the god of water to keep him. So when the princess found him, she named him after the god of the water. He came out, Moses, god of the water. Hence, when he went back, he hit the sea. He hit the Red Sea. It stood up. He made frogs come out of the water. He turned the water for blood. Because who was Moses? He was the god of water. Jochebed, his mother, proved it. She put him in the water and see if the water would protect him. But then she put him in the type, a little type of an ark, the same a miniature one. It says she built an ark and pitched it with tar. It said, let's see if he's the, uh, if my Moses is the Noah, because one saved the world. The other one saved the people. I'm sorry. Noah saved the family. He only saved a souls and all the beasts. So Noah saved the, the, a, 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 a portion of the world and his kids. Moses would save a whole nation. Jesus would save the whole world. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him becomes that kind. So you have a kind that can only save his family. No one would fear to save this whole household, Hebrews chapter 11. Then it says Abraham, uh, you know, he saved his people. And so you got all of these people saving their house. And that's who's at the airport. All of them have their own house and their group to their own terminal. Now, so you got the sons of God here, the sons of God there, the sons of God. So I, I'm, I'm trying to show you why these sons. Also, why we in Deuteronomy. Look in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 43. Why? Interesting verse here. But I have to explain to you because I study all these different trans, uh, not translations. I, I, I study the original transcripts along with the different translations. So people don't like me saying this, but I, the Holy Spirit told me, don't listen to the immigrant people. So, so when I first started saved, the Holy Spirit wanted me to read all of the read various types of translations. So I have re read over 70 different translations of, the, uh, of, of our Bible, New and Old Testament. All right. So and so in my collections, I got multiple different translations. I got so many different translations, and my job is to read them and find out the discrepancy by my gift of having photogenic memory. Hence, I didn't memorize the whole Bible. If I read something in the translation that I read before in another Bible, my brain says to me something is different. Then when I see the different verse, I go to it and say, what's the difference? And hence, let me show you a different verse from the brain. Verse 43, read it. Rejoice, O you nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants and will render vengeance to his adversaries. So there's something wrong here. Why? Depending on the translation, it's going to determine how you read that. Why? Because in the Septuagint, it talks about Moses talking about the sons of the divine. God has got to deal with the, dealing with the sons of the divine ones, the sons of God. But in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it says all divinities. But in the Masoretian text, it's missing entirely. They dropped out a whole verse. So there's verses missing depending on what you translate from. You know, it's an amazing thing. I tried to print off something before I came down here, and my printer wasn't working right, and so it, it, it prints every other line. And, only, and because I know the whole thing, I know that line is missing, but if I gave y'all a copy, y'all wouldn't know that the line is missing. So the Masoretic text, when it went to translate it, things was missing from the, whatever they were writing from, and hence a line was mixed out. That you don't know that Moses said that God was, was doing this by the sons of the divine or the sons of God. 
like you learn in verse 8 and 9. So Moses is continuing to the sons of God thought. Hence, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 2 and 3, he talks about the Nephilims and the mighty ones. And then you find out that those Nephilims and mighty ones were Abraham and the people you've been reading about in Genesis. You've been calling them by their name, but you didn't know that some of them was Nephilim and other of them were mighty ones, depending on who their mother was, because it never tells you who the mothers are until basically you get to Sarah. And you don't realize that Sarah is a daughter of a mighty one. Remember that Abraham and Sarah were sister and brother. They had the same father but different mother. It seems like somebody liked sleeping with someone that was producing these mighty ones. Why? Who was Sarah? Sarah was a woman that could possess seed. She was different from other women. And so hence, people in the New Testament are known as children of Sarah. Who called Abraham Lord, trusting in God. So what did Sarah call Abraham? <gasps> You're not going to believe this. She called him Lord. Because who was Abraham? He was a Lord. But on earth, he was known as a mighty prince among them. That's why in his days, men of, of, of great stature would say to him, are you not a mighty prince among us? And what did that mighty prince do? He talked to the gods. Hence, Abraham was known as the friend of God. Because Abraham in his days was already talking to God. That's how they became friends. And some one day, one day he was talking to his friend named God. And he said, look, walk before me and be right. And I'll make you something. I'm going to use you to bless the whole earth, he told him. And anybody that curse you, I'll curse. And everybody that honor you, I'll honor you. You see, you didn't know that Abraham was a friend of God, even though the Bible told you. And so last week, a week for last, because this is being recorded the same day, but it's going to be played a different week. <laughs> I want you to hear this. You found out that Abraham has the group that are known as the friends of God, those that walked with God as a friend. And so here in Deuteronomy, now I'm going to blow this up a little better for you to put more meat to what I said so people say, where do you get your stuff from? Let's, let, let Daniel the prophet help you. Daniel chapter 10. In the book of Daniel chapter 10, Daniel is praying because he's trying to understand times. Remember, this is the same Daniel that was told that he was said in, he would be in his group and come up at the resurrection in his group at a set time. They even tell you how many days it would be before he come out of his grave with his group. But look in Daniel 10 and, and verse, verse 10. And behold, a hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee and stand upright. For unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood trembling. Then he said unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy word. So this is Gabriel. If you know anything about this, this is Gabriel. And it tells you the time of when this is. This is in, in, in verse 1. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel. So I want you to listen to this. In the, in the days that Cyrus was king, Daniel was one of his what? Ambassadors. You got me? One of his counselors. So he said, and so Daniel gets to see this creature, verse 5. And, and I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man. So what do the creature look like? He doesn't look like an angel. What do he look like? He looks like a man. So I want you to understand that there's entities above us that look just like us. But their bodies are made different for where they live. But they can come into our world. That's important to understand that. There are people that look like us. Hence, when the sons of God saw the daughters of men, they saw someone that looked like them that slept with them. Didn't look like oh, eight, eight arms and nine eyes, okay? And so, but look at him. He was clothed in linen. Go ahead, Couture. He, a man clothed in linen whose loins were girded with fine gold of euphaz. 
His body also was like the barrel, and his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like in color to polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. So he looked like a man, but his color and appearance, in other words, you, 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 we got white, black, red, yellow, and all that, but this guy color is different from our color. So he's describing his color. And then he says, then, and then he tells Daniel, boom, boom, boom. And then Daniel falls asleep. And Daniel, but then let's go back to what he tells Daniel. So he tells Daniel in verse 13. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days. We are in first chapter 10, verse 13. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me. So he's saying up there in the world where he's from, they have a guy known as, he's a prince. And them two didn't get along. This is important for y'all to understand what happens on the earth with everything I shared the last two messages. To put this all together. In the world above us, they have people with nations with names. So this guy that had a problem, he lived in a country up there named Persia. And he was the prince of Persia. That Gabriel, the angel, lived in the country too. He doesn't tell us what country he comes from. But he says, I was, I, and meantime, remember, who's the king down on the earth that Daniel is a spokesman for? Verse 1. Cyrus the who? So notice that there's two what, y'all? There's a king on the earth, but over that king in his kingdom is another Persia, and he has a prince over here. Listen to me. The tongues that come down and the people come down, they're coming from their nations and their kingdoms. L don't take my word for it. I'm going to do this real slow again. Verse 13. I'm going to read in control. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me. Where was he located? In heaven. And how many days did he resist me? 21 days. But lo. Michael, one of, what kind of, not a prince, a chief prince. So over the princes up there, there's someone higher. He's known as a chief prince. And so the chief prince came and moved that other prince out my way. But who is the chief prince? So he says, go ahead. And I remain there with the kings of Persia. And so guess what he remained while the, the chief prince was dealing with the prince. I remain with kings. So up there are people with, notice, uh, three different titles. See, there's kings, there's princes, and there are chief princes. So, and, oh, wait a minute. Did he say they had a kingdom? So what's up above us? The same identical thing beneath them. Oh, it gets better. So he says, I come here to make you understand. That's nice and good. Then, so go to verse 20, because he's getting ready to leave. Then said he, knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee? And now will I return to fight with the So then he says he got to go back and fight. Wait a minute. They fighting up there. fighting up there only or are they fighting down here let's see who so watch what he says he said i'm going and i'm gonna whip that sucker butt now why because he's been weakened by who michael mm -hmm. michael didn't destroy him he weakened him enough for the king to fight remember he said i was among the kings yes. so what did that tell you about gabriel he's a king and when he gets in trouble who did he go it tells you i got in trouble I was fighting this other king, and I was losing. So I went back to the chief prince. Say, I need a little bit more reinforcement. Chief prince came. And I waited for him to wear that boy up. And while he was beating his tail, I broke through and came here to give you that, give you the message. Then he said, but now I got to go back. <laughs> Verse 20. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grisha shall come. So... Guess who's going to come and beat him up? I'm going to help who? I'm going to help the kingdom up there called Greek. There's a prince up there. 
And down here, it's gonna re, it's gonna resemble what the war is like up there. Alexander the Great is gonna come and take over the Medes and the Persians. If it doesn't happen up there, it doesn't happen down here. But who called it to happen down here? Daniel. Who called the Lord to come in Sodom and Gomorrah? The cry reach heaven. The prophets are the ones that call them down to bring the end to nations and kingdom. Mm. That means if prophets call down something, America is over. And I already told y'all, they already called. Donald Trump was the last for Christianity in America. Many, many tackle your fossin. It's already spoken. You can't undo it. Moving right along. I don't want to go there yet. This is a message for y'all, not, not for the world. Continue, verse 21. But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth, and there is none that holdeth me in these things, but Michael your prince. And so when you start chapter 11, it notices this is not the first year of Cyrus. This is the first year of Darius. Also I, in the first year of Darius, the meek, understood to confirm and strengthen him. So what did Daniel went to go to do with the new president and the new king? He said, I went to strengthen him. And then will I show thee the truth. So he's saying to Darius, I'm going to tell you the truth. Look what he says. Behold, there shall stand three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all, and by his strength through his riches, he shall stir up against the rim of Grecia. So he's telling him, you got four more generations and you over. What did the prophet tell the person that he was in the administration of? The same as saying to Donald Trump, you, you only had four years. Or you, did he have eight? Do you know none of the prophets like myself and others were told directly by God whether he had four or eight, but all of us were told he had four, so he couldn't be impeached during those four, nor could he be killed in those four. But as I tell people as a prophet, January the 20th ain't got here yet. Why? Stay tuned. And, and on that note, and on that note, I'm done.